The arrival of the assassin marks a surprising turning point in the Louisiana case. Before its arrival, the entity's major aspects were certainly formidable combatants, though designed for other purposes. The humanoid assassin, though, it seems specially sculpted to shock humans, and certainly to destroy them. Accounts of such a creature are similar. That of a tall humanoid figure who can seemingly melt into a swarm of insects. Whether or not this is a result of trickery or actual physical transformation, it's available. Though, with all things related to this case, I am inclined toward belief in the most crazy and bizarre theorizations one day, and incredulous the next one. Of this, I've noted a remarkable pattern in its behavior. The assassin is capable of some really remarkable feats. Chief among them, the ability to split into several let's call manifestations of itself. These manifestations would function as a distraction. You see, they will attack the hunter independently, while the true assassin will use the opportunity to find the right moment to cut you down. Thankfully, Harold Black preserved much of what we know. His encounter with the assassin seems to have forced him into the man we review today. His accounts, in typical Blake Young fashion, are indirect by modern academic standards. Indeed, he does mention his failed career as a writer, and his inability to inform clearly seems to affirm this. However, this does give a rare insight into the abilities of this assassin, particularly their development from a human host. You'd be forgiven for missing some of the more pragmatic information, such as that the assassin chest seems to harbor a vulnerable point. Light the shadows that had so dug my steps on the brightest days. The words had come to me as I stumbled out of that labyrinthine prison, having for the first time become a quarry, nay, a prey, to that roving swarm. My friends were dead, butchered by its blades, and my final shots had no effect as they all reached the cheddar of iron and stone. The swarm undisturbed, the swarm lurching towards me on a hundred thousand legs. I have bolted countries, burst through doors, left the courses of my comrades just to come outside again to breathe clean air, and in that moment of unrivaled and brilliant life, the final words of my pa came to me. Light the shadows that have so jogged my steps on the brightest days. Words that I had fled from. South to Atlanta, Tallahassee, Jackson, New Orleans, and finally Baton Rouge. Yet they had caught up to me. His cursed prophecy proved self-fulfilling. In the weeks immediately after his passing, I'd awoken from the wreck in a cold sweat and been trapped in the rumination until sunup. Watching the dark corners for the specter they heralded. In the end, it proved that the unease they caused hit me on a path fraught with pitfalls. A path here. Blinking in the sun, staggering down the steps of their prison, they came to me as a stroke of clarity. I will light the shadow that had dug his step. I will repay my inherited debts. The assassin, so aptly named, destroyed the man I was, 
a man scared of his shadow. In his place stands someone I am unfamiliar with. Perhaps this is the one purpose of this journal. The second of this aforementioned repayment. A great deal of blood has been shed in the writing of these pages. It will prove my life's work and perhaps the out of others too. I was not always a hunter, far from it. Many, many years ago I studied natural science at Harvard. I was an ardent believer then, but the secularization of school proved to disillusion me. I dropped out aspiring else to be a writer, though I found little success. Soon after, my father passed, and so I made my way south. In October of 1890, I was in New Orleans. I was a staff writer for one of the papers, and I followed naturally the murders of David Hennessy with great professional and personal interests. You see, unseen assailants in the dead of night gunned down the police chief. Despite a relentless hunt, his killers were likely never caught, and eventually, 19 Italians found themselves imprisoned. I was there for the various lynching. I remember two of the wretched men dragged from jail. I must admit, the sight was too much and I had to leave. On the perimeter of the crowd, I saw another also making his leave. The man was hugely tall and incredibly agitated. Something about him struck me as odd, and I began to follow. Some way down the street, he noticed me. A shot rang out from the mob and at the prison, and on that mark he began to sprint. I gave chase, struck by a sense of abandon. My pursuit led me down an alley where cornered the man spun. He kicked up a cloud of dust into my face that blinded me. To my disgust, by happenstance, he seems to have caught a large beetle, which I felt crawling across my face. As I cleared my eyes, I hardly believed them, for it seemed the man was scaling the sheer wall of the adjacent building, seemingly hanging off the wall. He threw something at me. It missed me by just an inch. As it thudded into the ground, I realized it was a long, slender blade. I, f I fled. I fled immediately, leaving the man to disappear over the eaves. 